I am going to be presenting work that we have done with uh, Miguel on redistributive effects of social protection in Namibia. So I'll present and he will answer the questions. Here is um, the outline of the issues that we are going to be talking about. Just a little bit of introduction, why social protection um, in Namibia? And from there, we look at the structure of co uh, social protection where we have contributory schemes that are linked to labor market participation and non-contributory schemes that were introduced by the government um, for various reasons, we'll talk about them. And then a brief look at the um, analytical methods that we use and then the results. We are still working on this paper and your contributions or your um, questions will be very useful in improving it. So, if you look at uh, the background of Namibia, when they got independence in 1990, there, there, there was significant inequality between the different uh, groups that were there. The colonial administration then was an extension of what was happening in South Africa. It was well, controlled by South Africa. So the same apartheid system that was in South Africa was applicable in, in Namibia. And generally, the uh, indigenous um, Namibians initially were not allowed to join the social pension that was introduced then. But then over time, they did relax that, but the earnings or the transfers were different between the groups, such that um, what the white population was earning was far much larger than what the blacks were earning. And even within the black community, there were some groups that were favored over others. So you have some divide and rule of some sort that allowed some guys to earn more. Then when independence came, the government decided to address those issues, and part of it was to try and reduce inequality between the groups, as well as um, to take care of the aged among the Africans who initially were not benefiting from the old age pension, which had been inherited from the South African system in the 1940s. Yeah, this is the structure of the social protection as it stands in Namibia. They have quite a number of provisions and the legal framework allows for quite an elaborate system. And here we have the contributory schemes and all these ones are linked to the labor market. If you are working, you contribute, you benefit from uh, all these, but there are some that are, we have not discussed. We are getting, uh, trying to put together data on that and some have not yet been introduced. They have just the framework that they need to come up with a pension and medical aid fund, but it's not yet in operation. Then here we have the non-contributory schemes where the government introduced some of these protection, uh, social protection measures saying we need to improve the conditions of um, the disadvantaged members of society. And the ones that we are going to be focusing mainly on, or that we have grouped as social uh, assistance, are the ones that I've highlighted there. This one has been studied quite a lot, the old age uh, pension scheme in Namibia. And it's a flagship of what some African countries can learn from in order to help um, the old aged persons. So these are the methods that we use, the general um, poverty indices. We try to look at the um, level of poverty within the society. Then the um, Gini coefficient, as well as a disaggregation of the Gini coefficient by income sources, so that we can tell which of the different main income sources um, has what effect on inequality. So here are some of the results. First. Just to let you know that we, we, here we used the um, Namibia Household Income and Expenditure Survey for 2009-2010. As with many countries, I presume, in Africa, data is a real issue. And all the, all the, uh, to give credit to Namibia, I think they are, they are doing well if you compare the 1993 survey to the 2003-2004 and this one. The earlier ones are not easy to crack because 
there's no code book that explains you what they did. They just gave some variables, which you are not quite sure where they come from. But we are working on that, and hopefully we'll be able to discern something useful from the 2003-2004 one, so that we can make comparisons between what was happening in 2003-2004 and what we find. So, using the um, analysis from the National Statistics um, Office, or the Namibia Statistics Authority, the poverty lines that they used for, uh, in 2009-2010 are those, and we use the same information for our analysis. So that's the poverty situation. Generally, there is a higher level of poverty in rural areas than in urban areas. And the severity of the poverty is also worse in rural than in urban areas. If we look at um, the Gini coefficient, we realize there's greater inequality in urban areas than in rural areas. Interesting because it is from here that we, um, when we analyze the, uh, when we decompose the GDP, we tend to finger out the labor market as one of the drivers of the high inequality that we have. It's more vibrant in the urban areas, and that's where you have greater variability in terms of income. You have people who are really poor, and some who are earning quite significant uh, amounts of money, and that way you tend to have high income inequality. And here is another picture that um, emphasizes what we have here. Inequality has generally been declining over time, if you look at the overall figures. But if you look at the quintiles, generally between quintiles, th there's been growing inequality. If you look at uh, the second poorest group, less the bottom one, this is what has been happening to the control of income that they have, that uh, the difference between those groups has been increasing. The same for, um, I think the West is between the second richest 20% and the middle 20%, that over time they've been going up, even though the overall figure shows a decline in inequality. The only group that seems to be consistently uh, to be consistent with the national figures or the aggregate figures is between the richest 20% uh, and the fourth uh, richest group, where over time inequality between those two has been declining. Right, so what else do we have? We this, and now here we have the, um, using the survey data, we try to disaggregate the Gini figures. And we realize that if you look at labor income, generally a percentage change in labor income contributes to an increase in inequality between um, our households. But if you look at the other income sources where the social protection measures that are linked to the, form, uh, to the labor market, we grouped them as social security. And the other ones, under non-contributory schemes that I mentioned, we grouped them as the social assistance. That's what the government is offering to try and help households. Then any other income plus uh, um, transfer, uh, in cash transfers, between households, we group them as remittances. And then we also have an asset income and other sources that, we could, that could not be specified or identified within the data set. But what we find is social assistance and remittances, they tend to have a, the effect of reducing inequality between households. If we come up with um, Lawrence Caves, we can realize, I think, a number of interesting uh, issues from the decomposition that we have. In this first graph here, we have labor income contrasted with social assistance. And the labor income is what we have in blue here, that generally it results in more inequality between households than you would find if you compare with those households that uh, have um, social uh, assistance income. And take note that what we used here to come up with these figures are 
the households that identified a particular source of income as the main source of income. So the households, there is more inequality in households that identified labor income as their main source compared to those that identified social assistance as the main source of income. In that one, it's a comparison between labor income and cash and in-kind transfers, which uh, in, the, in, this, tab in the, this table we grouped under uh, remittances. We realize here that, again, labor income tends to be contributing more to inequality compared to these other transfers. If we look at this one, the fourth one is social assistance compared to assets. Those households with assets, they tend to be earning more and not everyone has access to assets and part of it is, is what was inherited at independence where the distribution of uh, assets has not uh, changed much. So the result is those with assets tend to be richer and the asset ownership tends to contribute more to uh, inequality than um, if you compare to households that have social assistance as main source of income. The last one of the graphs, we have social assistance income compared to social security. So again, what we find here is social assistance is more equalizing compared to social assistance. Of course, this will not be necessarily be surprising if you look at the, what is happening within the labor market where the average incomes, the, the differentials are quite high as well as the level of unemployment that you find within the economy. So what are the key challenges that, you find that Namibia has to deal with in order to deal with the differences in inequality across groups? A few issues that we've raised. One is that there's need to deal with the education system. Generally, the outcomes don't seem to be that good. Uh, the quality is not as good, good as it could be. But worse of it is that it is generally supply-driven rather than demand-driven. That means you find people that have a, set, a lot of people that are unemployed with certain qualifications, but those are not the qualifications that the industry is looking for, and therefore they are not finding jobs. Then there's generally been a neglect of, uh, neglect of technical and vocational education. Principally because among households, the perception is that if someone has a technical qualification, they are not smart enough, they are not as bright, but you must go to university if you are really intelligent. And it's, it's, it just doesn't add up because what the skill, what the economy is lacking are the technical skills which are not offered in the universities. It's these technical skills that we believe if that is emphasized, that will help. Then if you look at health outcomes, Again, there are some challenges there that uh, infant mortality is on the high side and the number of professionals, health professionals, uh, is not as high as it could be. Worse because they tend to rely more on foreign labor. People from, they get nurses and doctors from Kenya, from Cuba, from Zimbabwe. They've started training their own, but um, the first crop will be in a few years' time, but already quality issues have started coming up because they, they, there are a lot of challenges to their medical school. Then the last point that we think may need to be dealt with if equality has to be achieved has to deal with um, corruption and nepotism. These are things that are not so easy to measure, but you see them happening and every now and then they are in the press, particularly when it comes to tendering processes and the tenders tend to be won by people with political um, connections, but uh, sometimes the quality is not always as good. And it's a problem. Now they've recently uh, launched a national housing scheme to try and help, uh, they call it a mass housing scheme, to help those at the bottom who have not been able to buy houses. But the delivery system has not changed, and it's mainly the uh, big construction companies or the proper developers that are getting the tenders to do that. And it's not going to have a big dent on housing in Namibia. It's likely to keep housing still very expensive. So that's what we have done for now. We hope um, as we continue working on the paper, we'll be able to 
um, use other methods of disaggregating the gene, uh, decomposing the gene, and see which of the different components of income are driving inequality within the country. So, what do we conclude from here? A few issues. Uh, the main one being that labor markets and associated incomes, they tend to be the ones driving the growth of inequality within the country. So perhaps if we address some of the labor market problems that we have in Namibia, that may have a, then an equalizing effect if we take into account that there are those households that have no people participating in the labor market, but if we can help them get in there, maybe that will help. Then generally, the social assistance schemes tend to reduce inequality. Um, there are issues with access to, to the social assistance uh, schemes, particularly because the country is vast, very, very big, and there are certain areas where access to these, even though households qualify, they don't access them. And another problem is um, illiteracy. There are some people who are, are not able to follow through and fill in the forms to access this uh, social assistance. So basically, that's what we have. And I still have a few more minutes, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> we can go on for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.